Now, as I'm sure many of you know that are watching the show, Donald Trump is tweeting again and tweeting about his former White House advisor, Omarosa. And he just posted this a short time ago. Quote, when you give a crazed, crying lowlife a break and give her a job at the White House, I guess it just didn't work out. Good work by General Kelly for quickly firing that dog. Um, we've heard it said before, and we've heard it uh, discussed before about how tyrants and autocrats and, yes, fascists, communists, others uh, have used the language of dehumanization uh, to justify, uh, well, a movement away from democracy and a movement away from decent standards. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, just uh, in the past 10 minutes, I, I did a quick search uh, on, uh, on why certain leaders do that. I found an NPR article um, where they interviewed David Livingstone Smith, uh, who wrote a book called Less Than Human, The Psychology of Cruelty. And as NPR explained during the interview, that during the Holocaust, Nazis referred to Jews as rats. Uh, in Rwanda, uh, genocide was often justified uh, with the calling Tutsis cockroaches, slave owners throughout history, considered slaves subhuman animals. That was one of the key takeaways from the book Less Than Human, and it argues that it's important to define and describe dehumanization because, and again, this was written in 2011, because it opens the door for cruelty and genocide. Nobody's saying that Donald Trump is a Nazi. Nobody's saying that he's Adolf Hitler in 1938, 1939, 1940. But you can see time and time again, and I'll, I'll go to Alicia here, uh, this is actually how dictators and tyrants open the door, and they do it by dehumanizing their political opponents. Right, and you know, Joe, there's a piece of this that's about language. We saw a lot of this language used during the campaign. Uh, the real problem, though, is the way that it connects to policy. So when you watch what's happening at our southern border, when you watch children being taken from their parents, when you face the reality that there's still over 500 of those children who have not been reunited with their parents, that goes back to this language. That goes back to the fact that we have set a baseline where these are no longer people. These are no longer people who are like us. They do not deserve the basic rights that we as Americans enjoy and deserve. And that's where this language becomes particularly scary. Well, Alicia, let's follow up on that. Yeah. Because guess what led up to his, what I think many would think, uh, his savage behavior on the border? When he launched his campaign, he talked about Mexicans being racist. Mm -hmm. Just this past year, what did he call Hispanics? He called Hispanics breeders, like they were animals, like they were dogs, like they were mules. And we've seen it time and time again. So he uses that language, mm -hmm. and what does it move to? It moves to a policy where infants are ripped from their mother's breasts at the border, separated and possibly orphaned for life. There actually is precedent here. Mm -hmm. And, and Joe, this language is not new, right? I mean, this language has been played by those on the far right for a very long time. What's now alarming is how mainstream it is becoming so mainstream that it is now coming out of our White House. So when you hear Laura Ingram giving her, you know, rant about the United States, the changing nature of the United States, the demographic shift that is happening in the United States, her connecting that demographic shift to immigration, that's not a dog whistle, that is a blow horn, and it is intended to rile up people who are upset about the fact that America is changing. And uh, the question I have is whether or not that is going to motivate people going into November on, on both sides of the aisle to come out and say, this is not the way that we talk about others in America, um, or to see if other people are motivated by the hate that is being spewed. And, and you just, Willie, you really don't know, because I just saw a poll in Florida, one of the most important Senate races in America. Rick Scott 
who has been a steadfast defender of Donald Trump from day one. He refuses to criticize him. We had him on this show. And quite frankly, he embarrassed himself by how much he was kowtowing to Donald Trump. Rick Scott is only behind three points in his race against Bill Nelson among Latinos. So you wonder whether this bigotry, uh, this dehumanization of Hispanics from Donald Trump and the Republican Party is actually getting through. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll learn a lot about that coming up in the fall. And there's also, as we talk about the border, the conflation of putting MS-13 out there in every conversation so that when it comes time to talk about separating children from their mothers, he again brings up MS-13 and somehow gives himself cover that those are the kind of people we're trying to keep out of the country when in most cases they're asylum seekers. There's the language, Phil Rucker, and as you cover the White House, there is the question as we look at this most recent tweet yeah. of why Donald Trump hired a, quote, crazed, crying lowlife and put her inside the West Wing if she was so terrible. Yeah, and Willie, he didn't just hire her, but he kept her in that job for a year. Yep. Uh, he tweeted yesterday that she was uh, not showing up to work. She would miss meetings. Her colleagues didn't like her. She was hated inside the building, and you wonder why he protected her for so long, why he kept her in that job. And it wasn't just any job. She was an assistant to the president, making the top salary of $180,000 a year. She was in the senior staff meetings. She had access to the Oval Office. She had uh, broad responsibilities uh, and paid for by the taxpayer. And so you really have to wonder where the management decisions were made, why they were made, and why she stayed for so long. Well, here's the reason he gave yesterday in a tweet. He said, when General Kelly came on board, he told me Omarosa was a loser and nothing but problems. I told him to try to work it out if possible because she only said great things about me. That's why she remained in her position. That's, that's exactly right. And, and President Trump took advantage uh, of her through that year. She would be thrust out to defend him anytime there was something controversial or he'd say something uh, that was perceived as racist or, or sexist or misogynist or what have you. It was Omarosa, uh, among others, who would go on camera and defend him and be, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a face uh, defending him. And he liked having her there. Uh, but it's important to remember this is not his personal private enterprise. This was the government of the United States. She was an employee of the taxpayers and yeah. uh, stayed in that job for a year. Michael Steele, I guess we shouldn't be surprised when a reality show host is elected president that he be brings that reality culture <laughs> with him and many of the culture, the characters from the, that reality show to his side inside the White House and running the United States government. Absolutely. From from the very beginning, this is what this has been. Every day is another episode uh, in an ongoing series. Uh, the president plays this out on Twitter. Uh, all of the characters inside that orbit, uh, you know, play out their respective roles. Uh, and, and it gets manifested in moments like this, where at some point, as we've seen, uh, the villain, uh, in this case, Omarosa, who's, who was brought into uh, Trump's world originally to play that role uh, on The Apprentice, uh, strikes back. And now the president uh, is uh, having to deal with, uh, you know, a, a person of his own creation. Uh, she is his mini-me. Uh, and, and in many respects, um, does Donald Trump uh, a great <coughs> service because she does Donald Trump better than Donald Trump in many respects. And he's trying to figure out how to get his footing to deal with her. I take from this tweet one other interesting thing. I was it, listening to the earlier conversation about it, uh, and I couldn't help but thinking the use of the term dog um, at the end of that was Trump's way of saying something that he knew he couldn't put in print mm. uh, about Omarosa. Uh, and so that just tells you just how much he, she has gotten to him. Uh, and, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not she can bring out of Donald Trump something that we rarely get to see, and that is an uglier side of what is already an ugly side of Donald Trump. Well, and by the way, the ugliness continues this morning. Uh, not verified yet by NBC, but CBS had Elmarosa on and another tape. Um, Brian Class tweeted this in a recorded call, uh, Katrina Pearson allegedly, Katrina Pearson, <clears throat> a senior Trump campaign official, thought about how she could best spin a recording where Donald Trump was using the N-word. And <clears throat> Klaus reminds us, in case you missed it, that's the same Katrina Pearson wondering whether there are any, quote, pure breeds left. And he subtweeted a Katrina Pearson, uh, a Katrina Pearson tweet 
Perfect. Obama's dad born in Africa, Mitt Romney's dad born in Mexico, are pure breed, any pure breeds left. And at least these, these are people that Donald Trump surrounds himself with. These are people that Donald Trump's perfectly fine with. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not just that he's using the N-word, it's that they're trying to spin it the best way they can spin it, and the person trying to spin it is, uh, is, is saying publicly that she's disgusted that there are no, quote, pure breeds left. Well, that's really big picture, I think, what we should take away from this episode. It's not really about Omarosa so much, just as it's about someone who came in, was clearly opportunistic, with no loyalty. As soon as she decides that the Trump bandwagon isn't worth staying hitched to her, I mean, she was fired, too, uh, jumped ship and would rather do that than to take a payout every month by working at the slush super PAC that is paying people to go on all-expense trips around the country. And so so you see with her what other Trump officials will probably do in the coming months and years. They're going to also come out with their own stories and disavow as they all try to take care of themselves because Donald Trump has shown that he's all about his own self-interest and that has trickled down to everyone on the staff too. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.